Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Hello everyone, I'm Troy Mullen. Thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. Glad you could be here for our last show of July. Got a lot to tell you about on this week's broadcast. And beginning our show, we've seen the weather settling down across the state. If you'll recall, just within the last couple weeks, we've had triple digit temperatures and another round of flooding. And producers who experienced flooded fields in their corn and soybeans will need to check for diseases in those crops. For corn growers, Nebraska Extension's Sarah Sivitz says stock rot could be a problem. And if your corn was underwater during the early stages of development, look for Crazy Top. It is kind of the way that it sounds. It has this crazy tassel that develops. It's just a bunch of little leaves that develop in that region. And it could affect not only the tassel, but it could impact the ear as well. So your yield might be a little less than that area or in those plants that were infected. But otherwise, stock rots are going to be probably one of the major concerns that people are going to want to pay attention to in their fields this year, especially leading into harvest time. Especially if you have disease history in those fields, you may be able to see that pretty prevalent this year. For plants that were stressed at any time during the growing season, you know, their major goal is to produce an ear. And so they're going to take those resources wherever they can get it, whether it was flooded and their roots are just not developing quite as right after the flooding event, or maybe there was some uh, nutrient losses, some nitrogen leaching out, things like that. A lot of things happen during a flood. And when it comes to soybeans, diseases like sudden death syndrome and brown stem rot may appear. However, growers are cautioned to be especially mindful of Phytophthora. A phytophthora is definitely one that you're probably going to want to pay attention to. It's one of those diseases that it needs water, it needs standing water in order to be activated and then the little spores will swim over to the plant and initiate infection and then gradually over time you're going to see those plants wilt and die and you're, you're probably going to see some yield loss in there as well but it can easily be confused with brown stem rot. Symptoms are similar in the fact that they have lesions that develop from the soil line up, but the way that uh, if you were to split the stems and look them over, um, brown stem rot, as the name indicates, if you were to split that stem open, you'd see little brown platelets. And I think diagnostics is gonna be really important for a lot of those. So that way you can look next year, okay, what do I need to do? Do I need to add a certain seed treatment? Do I need to look, be looking at genetic resistance or partial tolerance or things like that in order to help manage some of those diseases? We've included more information on these diseases on the Market Journal website. And along with diseases, summer is a time for managing weeds. We recently attended the glyphosate-resistant Palmer Amaranth Management Field Day in Carleton, Nebraska. Market Journal's Maddie McIntosh shows us how to keep the weeds out of your fields and why it's so important to stay vigilant. Another growing season means another year of weeds. And much like previous years, there's one weed that just won't go away. You know, this is the ideal weed. The uh, Weed Science Society of America, a national organization that most weed scientists are involved in, this group has done survey work across the U.S. and today Palmer amaranth is the most troublesome weed, the number one weed of U.S. agriculture. And I think there's several reasons for that. Nebraska Extension Weed Management Specialist Dr. Amit Jala explains that Palmer amaranth is a weed that will re-emerge several times throughout a single growing season. And to make matters worse, the typical herbicides used have little to no effect on this persistent weed. Palmer amaranth has also evolved resistant to glyphosate uh, as well as a uh, number of ALS inhibiting herbicides. Uh, so. Uh, number of uh, post-emergence herbicides that we are using in soybean, it is no more long effective to control this resistant palmer amaranth. Jason Norsworthy, distinguished professor of weed science at the University of Arkansas, says the reason for these stronger weeds is repetitive use of herbicides, which has allowed the weed to become resistant to the majority of brands previously used. But producers shouldn't panic yet. 
As Amit says, there are still ways to take back control. We can still control this. Um, we have to do a number of techniques. Only one herbicide or only one program will not work. Uh, our best recommendation is you have to start with a very good uh, pre-emergence herbicide. You have to apply immediately after planting soybean. Uh, that should have multiple effective site of action. And then you need to come back with uh, another post-emergence herbicide that can provide effective control of glyphosate resistant palmar amaranth. Jason also says the time frame for application is very small and producers need to stay on top of the control or they risk losing a field and everything growing in it. The ability to time post-emergence herbicides becomes very challenging when most post-emergence herbicides will say apply to Palmer amaranth that's four inches or less. So with that, from the time of emergence to that four inch maximum cutoff at, per the label, you're only talking about a, a, a few days before you can quickly ex, uh, exceed that. And for that reason, we focus on the need to overlay residual herbicides, use a residual herbicide at planting. When you come back in 21 days later and make a post-emergence application, you really got to ha have to have a residual herbicide in that system. If those soybeans haven't canopied or else, you're going to get another emergence flush and you're going to get, um, you're going to get escapes and failures. A complete crop loss has been observed in some fields. I mean, it, it, it will just completely uh, decimate a crop and there is nothing there to, um, to harvest. This is one of the most competitive weeds that we have. Uh, part of it is numbers, part of it is, is growth rate, but it can completely uh, wipe out a crop. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Maddie McIntosh. If you have Palmer Amaranth in your field, Jason and Amit recommend sending in your sample to your local extension office to determine what herbicides it's resistant to, and this will help not only you, but other producers as well. Let's take a few minutes to get a look at the markets, and I was joined by DTN analyst Todd Holtman on Tuesday. We talked late corn pollination, wheat harvest, and the South American markets. But I started off by asking if the stable forecast we've been seeing is reflected in the stability in the markets. It's certainly uh, a much easier forecast for crops than the almost triple digits that we saw a week ago. So that bit of threat, especially as corn gets closer to pollination, um, it is, uh, has subsided for now. So that's one thing the market doesn't have to worry about. Uh, what the market is still worrying about, however, is that we don't have a real solid planning estimate yet for corn or soybeans and uh, we're just going to have to wait a few weeks until we get to that August 12 uh, WASD date from USDA to see a second survey. Yeah, and that kind of leads into this next question. What do you think is going to be the big story as we head into August? Is it going to be that corn pollination or uh, more tracking the weather or acreage reporting, something else? What do you think? You know, uh, all of the above, but I have to say for my money right now, I think the planning estimate is going to be uh, a really big deal. It's just something that we have not nailed down yet uh, this year, and that's uh, very unusual for uh, here, as here we are in late July, not to have a, a credible planning estimate yet. Um, you know, it's typically hard enough this time of year trying to predict a crop size when you're just trying to guess one variable of yield. But when you have two variables up in the air, meaning acres and yield, it's just almost impossible for the market to come up with uh, uh, any kind of a narrowing uh, estimate for, for what the crop size could be. So it's, it's uh, it, uh, a lot of extra uncertainty this time of year that we don't normally see. And I think the August 12th planning estimate will do a lot uh, to help move us forward in that regard. What do you think is going to be the timeline as to when you think we could see a concrete number on prevent plant acres? Uh, well, uh, the first estimate of that will also come out August 12th, as I understand. And um, uh, as an analyst, I have to say, I know there's a lot of talk about prevented planting acres, and that is an important part of the mix. But even if I knew the prevented planted acres today, we still wouldn't exactly know what the starting base number is, so uh, we're really not going to be helped until we get uh, an actual estimate of acres planted, and that's what we're looking for on the 12th. And also, Todd, interesting year for wheat. So harvest in Nebraska should be around uh, upper 70s, nearing that 80% range, but as we're recording this, current harvest less than half that. What's the market outlook here? Um, 
overall, overall, uh, you know, the outlook for wheat is so uh, predicated upon what is happening in the world as far as the world wheat crop. And overall, the world's wheat crop still looks good, or I should say good enough. There are some uh, limited weather threats uh, around the globe, but we haven't seen any serious threat to production yet. And so as long as uh, USDA and, and the International Grains Council both are estimating uh, record world wheat crops in 2019, it's just hard to imagine uh, much higher wheat prices. Now having said that, I will say there is one little asterisk, and that is wheat is heavily influenced by the corn price here in the U.S. So uh, if we do end up having some kind of a bullish situation in corn, that would have a wheat influence, but that's about its only hope this year. And looking at things down in South America, and there's been so much going on locally, it's easy to forget that it's harvest time for them. So what updates can you share for us in South America? Well, overall, I think uh, we're all reasonably assured that South America had, has had much better crops this year. And especially in the case of corn, Brazil's looking at a record corn crop this year. And, uh, you know, it was just one year ago, they suffered dry weather and Australia, or Argentina was in drought. Well, uh, that's almost flipped uh, opposite this year. They have much bigger crops, and both Brazil and Argentina together are probably going to export maybe almost 900 million bushels of corn more this year than they did one season ago. So that is a much uh, more competitive demand situation that our U.S. corn crop will face in the year ahead. And what are we hearing from China? It seems like the two biggest stories would still have to be news on the trade front and ASF. Yes, uh, in regard to ASF, that is one disease that's not slowing down yet. It continues to spread. It seems like every week or two uh, we hear about new cases or uh, new situations identified. There's even been talk of uh, uh, situations cropping up in Europe, which I think makes uh, a lot of uh, people nervous about pork production, where Europe is a big pork producer. And uh, as far as in Asia goes, it doesn't seem like that's slowing down either. It continues to spread throughout Southeast Asia. So there continues to be a uh, concern about grain demand uh, related to ASF. But in the bigger picture, I don't know that we've seen a big slowdown in grain demand. And of course, here in the U.S., uh, there may be a little bit of benefit uh, to increase pork exports this year. Not, uh, not as enthusiastic maybe as the market thought in March or April, but uh, some benefit indeed. And Todd, I'll end it today by asking if you have any uh, advice regarding uh, marketing or risk management tips for our viewers watching. What do we need to know? Yes, well, uh, typically, Troy, the seasonal peaks that we try to sell corn are uh, early June uh, for corn and early July for soybeans. We're past those seasonal peaks, but because this is such an unusual year, uh, the corn price is still offering a, a pretty decent uh, opportunity with the December contract around 430. That's, uh, I think, still a very valid hedge opportunity, uh, just you know, not knowing how uh, prices are going to turn out for the, rest, uh, the remaining 50% of the crop yet. But uh, that continues to be a good opportunity as we get closer to August. Next week, we'll be joined by crop economist Dr. Frayne Olson from North Dakota State University. Moving on, and it was 70 years ago this past winter that Nebraska Governor Val Peterson set up a command post in the basement of the Nebraska State Capitol. The reason? To manage Operation Snowbound, in which the Nebraska National Guard, along with other branches of the military, provided relief to people and livestock across a 29-county disaster area affected by a gigantic blizzard in the winter of 1948. Flash forward to this past March, and once again, the Nebraska National Guard was called in to help rural residents and livestock struck by massive flooding and blizzards. Read about and find some of the numbers that tell the story of their relief efforts in the July Nebraska Farmer. Time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market General Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. And Al, after the heat earlier this month, this past week has been quite a change. How does everything look as we close out July? 
Well, Toy, you are correct. We did see that heat break down as we moved through the weekend as that cold front came through. We did see widespread precipitation across much of the southern one-third of the state. The heaviest totals that we've seen in the one to three inch range with a few isolated totals between three and four inches occurred across most of southwestern Nebraska, central Nebraska, and, and eastern Nebraska, per, pretty much east central Nebraska. If you took a line from the northern half of the Panhandle and drew it straight eastward over to the eastern border of Nebraska and points to the north of there, really missed out on much of this heavier precipitation. We see most totals in the trace amounts to about a quarter inch with just about 10% of the stations receiving more than a quarter inch of precipitation that reported from this system. More importantly, as we go forward, of course, we've seen some dry areas developing into the area just to the north of Omaha that needed to see some precipitation. And of course, with the heat, there is some concerns about the lack of subsoil moisture, especially late planted crops. So we do have a couple opportunities in this next week and a more respectable precipitation pattern potentially developing as we get into the first full week of August that may assist us. But we still have to get through some of this heat that is building this weekend and of course returning again later in the middle of next week. So as we go to the upper air models, we have a little subtle wave that's moving through. This is going to strengthen as it moves toward the east and start to pull the cold front toward the southeast during the overnight hours. So we do have a low pressure system sitting in west central portions of Kansas that will help to lift some moisture up toward the north to intersect with the front and we'll see some scattered thunderstorm activity starting to develop across northern Nebraska and during the overnight hours we should see this wave start to move and slide toward the southeast. Although the models are showing low pressure system in northeastern portions of the state, I think this will be dropped a little bit farther toward the southeast and we'll actually see the precipitation shield that's showing us this more, or tomorrow morning in the northern part of the state actually be much farther toward the south. But regardless, it's going to bring much cooler air to the eastern part of the state and that will hold for a considerable portion of the first half of the week as we see low pressure in the Wyoming, eastern Wyoming, not having a lot of moisture to feed with and a little bit of monsoonal flow we see is really feeding into the front that's been moved to the east of us. By Tuesday, we start to see the ridge building back in, and so the warmer conditions are really going to start to uh, materialize in western Nebraska. We'll be well into the 90s. We'll probably still be stuck in the 80s in eastern Nebraska, but we would expect that that will start to occur as we go into Wednesday. One little piece of precipitation shown in southeastern portions of South Dakota may roll down the Mississippi River Valley uh, and impact portions of eastern Nebraska. We do show low pressure on Wednesday developing in western South Dakota and western Kansas, but most of the moisture is directed toward Missouri and Kansas and not so much into Nebraska. And then we see the expansion of this high pressure system such that we'll see some probably 100 degree heat in the southwest part of the state and some higher cattle heat indice values as low pressure starts to develop in, in northern Texas and west central Kansas. That'll help to spin some monsoon moisture around that periphery of that high pressure system impacting northern Nebraska. But as the system de deflects toward the southwest, we are most likely going to be looking at the monsoonal moisture feed around the periphery of this high pressure system. And that puts Nebraska in an excellent spot for precipitation, especially considering low pressure will develop in eastern Colorado. And we'll start to kind of congealing a thunderstorm activity during Friday that is expected to move across the state and become pretty substantial as we get into eastern Nebraska. If we look at the 8 to 14 day forecast, the models do indicate above normal temperatures reforming from next Thursday to the following Tuesday, but the latest model ones are actually keeping most of the heat just to the south of Nebraska. So we'll see if this verifies in terms of precipitation, drier conditions to the southern plains. It looks to me like some of this moisture will probably feed over top the ridge and the impact Nebraska. So I think we're going to see more above normal, at least in the western half of the state. Thanks, Al. Last week, we discussed how state leaders and those in the ethanol industry were reacting to the latest renewable fuel volumes proposal given by EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler. Now, to many directly involved and invested in the state's ethanol industry, it seems the proposed production increase wasn't enough to offset much of the damage done by RFS waivers or small refinery exemptions. And yet again, it seems as though ethanol producers are fighting an uphill battle. Here's Market Journal's Bill Dodd with more. Thanks, Troy. Now, the big concern for those opposed to such heavy-handed uses of the RFS waivers is the fact that many of the smaller refineries are subsidiaries of larger multinational oil conglomerates. In other words, a good share of the refineries that are being granted waivers from blending ethanol into their fuel are still under the umbrella of a larger corporation. And meanwhile, it's recently been reported that ethanol plants around the country will be planning on cutting output due to poor margins and oversupply. 
Recently, margins to produce ethanol in the Corn Belt have tumbled to a four-year seasonal low, while inventories are at the highest seasonally since 2010. The biggest issue, as we mentioned last week, is the fact that 2.6 billion gallons of production have been lost from 2017 to the present date due to these waivers or small refinery exemptions, and the renewable fuel volume proposal does not take that into account. Now, to put that in perspective, the potential corn demand lost from these exemptions would calculate to around 900 million bushels of corn, according to the Iowa Corn Growers Association. Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts also came out on the offensive, stating, This proposal does not reflect the agency's legal duty to enforce a robust RFS or the president's commitment to our farmers. Nebraska Ethanol Board Administrator Roger Berry explained to me how the agency is failing to meet its legal obligation to the ethanol industry. In 2017, a federal court told the EPA that they needed to make up for a 2016 um, uh, area where they shorted the ethanol industry 500 million gallons. EPA this year in the renewable volume obligations has flat out refused to add that 500 million get back in. So actually the, the uh, conventional ethanol of the renewable volume obligation should be 15 and a half billion gallons, not just the 15 billion gallons. But then you'll have people say, well, statutorily, we can't go over 15 billion gallons. Well, statutorily, we should be at a total of 30 billion gallons. 2.6 billion gallons have been lost in 17 for 2017 and 2018 for the waivers that have been approved by the EPA up to this point. 2.6 billion gallons. That's a lot of ethanol when you figure that we produce on, on corn ethanol uh, pretty close to that 15 billion gallons every year. So that's a huge percentage out of that. So that's a big loss to the economy of the state of Nebraska. It's a big loss to our ethanol producers and the hardworking employees at those ethanol plants. And it's also a big loss to our farmers and ranchers across this entire state who deserve better and who have a, are able to make a product that is so much better for the consumer, so much better for the air that we breathe, so much better for their car, but yet it continues to be blocked and run into the ground in any way possible by the big oil companies. And don't get me wrong, I, I paint it as, as we're enemies of oil. We're not. We need each other. We absolutely need each other. And uh, it, so I don't want it to sound like we hate oil because we don't. We need oil and want to work with them. Now without the oil industry, ethanol would have nothing to blend their product with, so why should oil conglomerates embrace ethanol? Well, it boils down to two words finite resources. Now we all know oil is a non-renewable source of energy. On World Energy Day in 2014, BP made a startling claim that based on reserve estimates of 1.68 trillion barrels, BP claimed the Earth has enough oil left for about the next 53 years. However, those figures are based on proved reserves, and in reality we may have several times that amount left. But for argument's sake, let's say we have enough for 300 years. If we were to blend 30% ethanol into our fuel supply, that could help extend the life of a very valuable resource, as well as the longevity of the oil conglomerates for nearly a century longer. In short, the ethanol industry could serve as a crutch of sorts for aging oil companies while they help pave the way for energy sources of the future and secure their place among them. So with year-round sales of E15 coming on and ethanol production down, how much impact will that have on the industry and how can it begin to see an uptick in the profit department? Roger tells me that profits in production will see an upswing in the limited use of waived gallons by the EPA and a healthy dose of consumer confidence. The best thing would be for consumers to start using more ethanol. If you have the opportunity to fill up with E15, go in and fill it up because every gallon produced helps out our, our producers, our ethanol producers and our farmers across the state. The next best thing that could happen is, is that those uh, small refinery exemptions, the ones that are lined up, the 38 that are waiting for uh, EPA to approve for 2019 year, uh, that they be uh, disapproved. That would be the best thing that could happen. Another area of concern is the current trade situation with China. As tariffs have been increasingly imposed by the current administration, imports of American ethanol have dropped to practically nothing. And that's a big hit for the industry, and with China set to implement a 10% blending mandate on fuel in the country, resuming trade would mean a big uptick for business in the ethanol industry. China was one of our biggest consumers of uh, American ethanol. Uh, the exports that we had to China generally led the charts until the tariffs hit. And, and now our exports to China are next to nothing. So if projections show with them starting to initiate a 10% blend mandate also in China, that we could be exporting 2 billion gallons. 
that's a lot of ethanol that we could be exporting to China. So it could have a huge effect on our ethanol producers here in the state of Nebraska, on our farmers here in the state of Nebraska, and across the nation. And actually, it could have a huge effect on every consumer in the state of Nebraska and across the nation, because we all know, especially in Nebraska, as the farming community does better, the whole state does better. When you consider the production loss through the heavy-handed use of small refinery exemptions and weighed gallons of blending granted by the EPA on top of trade woes facing the ethanol industry, the arguments made by Governor Pete Ricketts and the Ethanol Board, these complaints begin to look like reasonable grievances toward the current administration's policies. And Troy, that's what I've got my eye on this week, and we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Bill. For our final story this week, farmers, ranchers, and land managers will be able to learn about pasture and rangeland production at the 2019 Nebraska Grazing Conference in Kearney. This is the 19th year for the event, but Nebraska Extension's Dr. Darren Redfern says what makes the event so popular is its goal of delivering practical information that can be used for managing grazing lands. Of course, there's always a few new things sprinkled in each year, too. We've got a, got a big emphasis on uh, rangeland health. Uh, numerous speakers uh, will be presenting information um, on uh, soil health from a rangeland perspective. Uh, there's another session uh, where we're actually uh, we'll be presenting um, some information from an eight-year study that was conducted up at Barter Brothers Ranch in the eastern part of the Sand Hills, uh, where we'll be looking at uh, animal responses, vegetation responses, insect responses, and soil responses under different management strategies. The 2019 Nebraska Grazing Conference will take place August 12th, 13th, and 14th in Kearney at the Buffalo County Fairgrounds Exhibition Building. The afternoon of the 12th will include a plant ID tour where you'll be able to look at some different plant communities and learn about them. We've got more information regarding costs and registration on the Market Journal website. And make sure to get your registration in by July 31st to get a better rate. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. Next week, it's an emergency situation for farmers in western Nebraska. The recent collapse of an irrigation canal is putting over 170,000 acres of farmland in Wyoming and Nebraska in jeopardy. We'll bring you the latest. Hope to see you right back here next time. I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.